So welcome back, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, the expectation is that you all did enjoy your tea and coffee break. I know we are a little tight on time-wise. So let's begin the next session now. So the next session now is medical application, dental, maxillofacial, ortho orthopedics, medical devices with material and software simulation. So the first speaker or the presenter who I'm going to be inviting is Dr. Kalyanan Kanian. Dr. Kalyanan Kanian, please, if you can join me on stage, a round of applause, please. A round of applause, Dr. Kalyan Kanian. Thank you. So, okay, good morning, everyone. So, so thanks for the invite. So here we are, like I'm going to share our experience of like uh, 3D printing, how we use in our complex uh, hip replacements. So here you are able to see a socket, the stubbler and the femur. So even though it looks like a simple cup and saucer, we are able to put a normal cup and uh, saucer bone, which is very easy. But if you watch carefully, even though this is not an easy surgery to do with, this is an uh, x-ray of our one of the ankylosing spondylitis patient where the whole body is like stiff. The spine is just like a bamboo spine. Here we don't have any clue where there is difference between the astablus socket and the femoral head. Sometimes they are like fused together. But with only the anatomical landmarks, we are able to find where is the astablus socket and where is the femur. And we are able to revise those with our own anatomical knowledge. But the, it's not on a routine basis. So whenever the cup is round and it's easy to put a socket around sorry so this is a just for an anatomy and it's like a, it's easy to remember a normal regular cup and a ball it's very easy to put but what happens like whenever the astabular socket is like fractured there is no anatomical landmarks there is, when you open the hip you don't have any clue where to put your cup and how much you are going to put and where this your anatomical orientation. If any of the version or the abduction angle or the offset is going to change, that it is going to uh, jeopardize the patient's life for a nest all his whole life. So whenever such astabular socket is damaged, we will be landing up with a huge implants like this and we won't be able to guide like which implant we are going to use in the future scenario. So this not only happens in case of a fracture astabular, it's also a common scenario in case of revision surgery. Because the replacements in India have started almost like completed two decades, it's a time for revision where the socket is going to be like damaged and we are looking for something like a, uh, like a betterment clue or betterment implant to fix the quality of the bone. So this is our team, Dr. Sridhar from the head of the plastic surgery. He joined hands with Dr. Shandrum Patil. He is basically an orthopedic surgeon, but he spent most of his life in US in Scripps Clinic. So he was the initiative in uh, picking up the 3D uh, printer in uh, SIMS. And uh, SIMS, like we have, uh, like recently one of the ongoing thing is the cartilage production, 3D printed. And we are the one to have the robotics for the knee replacement first in Tamil Nadu. And almost we do all our knee repl replacements on basis of artificial intelligence using only the navigation. We all use almost all the striker ASM and uh, the logic GPS and uh, although the brain lab modifications and the recent is the Smith and Nephew Navio. And following the plastic surgery, they were been doing to replace the face and the skull. And over the time, we the four orthopedic surgeons, we started using it for our complex hip replacement scenario. So whenever you see a astabular socket is damaged, then we used to have a x-ray won't be sufficient. We used to go for a CT scan and uh, read about the images, the DICOM images, and uh, the Dr. Shantanu Patel takes care of like uh, cleaning the file, trimming the file, and creating the 3D print, which is ready for, uh, to make our 3D printer job to be ready. So this is our uh, 3D printer, which we use uh, on a routine basis, uh, Kritobot. It takes, uh, it, uh, it creates the hemipelvis or a total pelvis in a, a period of around like six to eight hours with unripped things. So after this, the surgery for the complex astabular uh, surgery is like a bit quite easy. Here we'll be sharing some of the examples of the cases which we've done in the, for the last uh, couple of years and have a good follow-up rate. So this gentleman is like 23 year old male. 
he had a uh, he was shifted from assam air ambulance base like he had a right shaft femur fracture but eventually he also had a left acetabular socket fracture which was missed in the first scenario so he was not able to put weight and he was almost like bedridden and when he reached red it was almost like three weeks old so the bone on the cartilage was already damaged in the socket so like when the cup is like normal regular it is easy to put a thr very easily uh, it takes around like say one to one and a half hours for the surgery but when a case of like a post osteoblar fracture where there is no anatomical clue and the navigation and robotics in hip replacement is not so common as in knee replacement it becomes tough and that's the time we started using this uh, 3d printer so that we have that model in hand so that we can plan in advance like what cup size we are going to put and what is the place we are going to put and what what type of screws uh, uh, what type of screws we are going to put that was a sin so in this what happens you reduce the operative time radically and there is less chance of infection less operative blood flow and uh, the patient is quick and is able to mobilize you and to give you a better result so that the hip is going to work for the next 25 to 40 years so another one example so again this is a gentleman of around like say uh, 40 years uh, like he had a acetabular fracture he was taken up for the operation theater for fixation but since because of no anatomical clue there was a huge bleeding and the surgery was uh, just cut off and he was like a uh, shifted and they didn't were able to do the surgery they shifted him to chennai to our institute and for him we did the uh, 3d printer prototype model 3d to print a prototype model and we decide like uh, where is the bone loss and what type of cup i'm going to use what type of uh, bone uh, augment this is an uh, augment which will be like replacing the bone and uh, we will also be like deciding where the screws will be going because we have to be careful about preserving the blood vessel and also the nerves which will be lying close to the pelvic bones so that patient won't land up any foot drop because doing a surgery putting a cup and the socket is easy but without any neurovascular complication and working of the hip is much more important so the surgery went fine so these are the intraoperative picks as we planned the same almost size of the cup was placed in the position and the same screws were used here we didn't use the augment we were able to use the femoral head as the augment and uh, even become the uh, the cost was like bit reduced so another one example is like uh, this gentleman had an osteoblar fracture uh, in uh, 2015 so with the plates it got infected so it is a, like a, a infection is like what the orthopedic surgeons everyone is like scared of so here we plan to do the totally pre-placement in a staged basis the first stage when we came we removed all the implants and we just left him alone with uh, local antibiotics and uh, once this uh, without the um, uh, screws or anything the ct quality is much more good and once they were able to get a yeah, prototype model of the 3D, we are able to decide what type of cup and again the size so that the, the final surgery we are able to put the cup and socket very easily and quicker. One more interesting case is like this 38 male journal, he is uh, like very active from Bangalore. So he landed up with a road traffic accident. If you watch carefully, the skin and subcutaneous, even the colon was damaged, he was roaming with a colostomy bag. So even though it, uh, it is not so easy uh, to define the landmarks where your skin incision is going to be, you don't have any clue how is the bone is going to be inside. Since like navigation in hip is not so common, it's like only available in Japan right now. And uh, one of the navigation which uh, is available in India, it just gives an idea of like the only the femoral offset and not the clue where you are going to put the cup. Recently, the Mako, the striker company has got a robotics that will help you to place the cup, but not in case of a revision scenario that is like a bit tough and it is much more costly also. So for this guy, we did the CT scan, we uh, made ready for the 3D printer and we got the prototype. Once we got the prototype, it was like much more like, uh, comp uh, which, uh, like we had the faith that it had a good bone quality, good bone union all around, the socket was good. But when compared to the other side, the femoral neck was short. So we are like prepared pre-operatively that what kind of femoral stem he was needed. 
so and also we decided this is a way sometimes we even autoclave the prototype model we get into the operative theater and just have a anatomical landmark uh, correlating with the 3d model and we will be doing the surgery quicker and efficiently and see for this guy we used a special stem called esrom where the offset is less so that the reduction and the perfect position is achieved so one more example is like this guy came with an acetabular fracture but he didn't have any clue whether it's a united or uh, like it's still union and the 3d is such a good thing like it uh, as it uh, just prints the model on the basis of the quality if it is union you will be able to see the bone two pieces like attached together if it is non union you will be able to see the two pieces are not attached together so it is like much more confident we are like uh, able to assure the patient that uh, 100% result will be given on so this is another one's uh, guy who landed up with a posterior dislocation and a special acute oligo syndrome so the, we need a, we did a 3d assessment model and we decided where our uh, femoral head is going to be where our cup is going to be and we did the, proce uh, the pro uh, procedure as like planned here we are like using the femoral head as like augment and uh, held up with screws and we are able to put the cup in that particular anatomical position and maintain the offset and also the limb length and uh, the better bearing uh, ceramic on ceramic was also given in such a complex situation so this is another one example where this guy had a bilateral fracture and uh, like both the side he was a dhs was implanted but one side got infected so we removed the implant we put a cement spacer for a particular time meanwhile we did a cd we got a 3d model and we know like where this time the augments are going to be used but since this guy didn't have the femoral head we are not able to use the uh, femoral head so we used an additional augment with that uh, screw trajectory everything planned as like accordingly so this is the way we plan the augments and exactly the same position the augments were placed the same patient has come up for the other hip replacement after a quite long, after a time so this is another one example of raju he had an acetabular fracture again uh, the surgery was made easy by making a 3d printer model so that we decide what type of implant so this guy like we are not able to uh, put a trabecular metal shell for this guy we were able to do only with a cage so that was also pre operatively decided these are another two more uh, cases like where this guy had a post acetabular fracture and it was like infected and the infection was not coming down and the bone quality was also not so great what to hold any greater implant so the option of like leaving the patient as such excision arthroplasty was taken because like uh, uh, it will be like too much if the ESR CRP is not coming and it will be like jeopardizing the thing so this 3D helps us to take a decision which is like wiser to the patient and to the perfect to perfect technology. So the 3D print biomodels gives a tactile feedback. We are able to uh, look at, relate the anatomical landmarks to the surgical landmarks and it gives a enhanced visual uh, stabilization. The operation time just comes down and it is so like such a cost effective. And uh, general anesthesia time is also reduced and the operative blood loss is reduced. Sometimes we make zigs and this is small part of like what we are using it and we also use it for a patient specific knee implant guides for total knee replacement also and mainly nowadays we use it for a tumor procedure where we use like templates where we are going to cut the tumor bone and where we are going to stop it and resect it and nowadays we are looking for more than a 3d prototype we are looking for a 3d printed implants so that in tumor surgery or in any pediatric it will be like much more useful and in case of revision scenario it will be useful for this purpose so again we are like going to present uh, it's one of the Sikot International 2019 Oman week. it is one of the latest technology based paper so we are happy to share thanks for the chance any queries No, sir, like, uh, I didn't get it. Like, your CT scan, you mean? Like, once the CT scan is ready, like, even we do, like, for our colleagues who are, like, wide. Only thing is that we ask them to do the CT scan on uh, minimal cut sections, 0.96, and they even can upload in a Google upload file, and we can download it, and we're at the same time we can start it.
Build time for the hemi pelvis it takes around like six hours. For the total pelvis it takes around like eight or uh, twelve hours. But with unripped, uh, uninterrupted power supply. If anything goes wrong, again it has to start. That's a major problem. Yeah, roughly a prototype model comes around like uh, uh, eight thousand bucks to create a model. Great, super. Yes. Thank, Thank you, you Doc. Thanks. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. A round of applause. <laughs> Great, superb, extraordinary, and enlightening because this information is. Now, I'd like to call upon uh, Daniel Martinez, and Daniel Martinez is the uh, anti microbial. 3D printing, active material, and uh, the future of biomedical 3D printing. Welcome, uh, Daniel Martinez. Thank you. A round of applause, please. Okay. Okay. Good morning, everyone. It's. Are you listening very well? Okay. Thank you, Dr. Shivu, for the invitation today to this big event. Um, I'm, my, uh, I'm, I'm the, the director of innovation of Cover 3D. Uh, we are in the antimicrobial 3D printing sector, okay? And a little bit of context of, uh, of me and my company, we are from, originally from Chile. Chile is, a, is this tiny, little, but long and thin country in South America, 19 million people. Uh, and basically, in Chile, we are experts in two things. Wine, but this is not about wine. And the other thing is copper. My, co my, my, uh, my country is producer of 35% of the total copper production. It's, it, it's a huge thing in, in Chile. And the government is going from selling and exporting raw material, raw copper material, with no added value to this industry, which is nano copper based solution, okay? And as you already know, copper is a very antimicrobial element, okay? But when you go from, so when you go from macro element to nanoscale, the effectiveness of, the antimicrobial effectiveness of copper rises exponentially, okay? Uh, well, this is a little about science, but copper has four mechanisms of action attacking at, in parallel to, uh, to a potentially dangerous bacteria or microbes. So th that is a very important thing because of antimicrobial resistance, which is a huge problem uh, in the world. We realized that these 3D printed medical devices has a high bacterial burden, okay? It's a global problem. Uh, basically, it's because direct contact with the skin, porous materials and complex geometries is difficult to clean these, these kind of things. For example, you have a, a model here, okay? And, uh, and the consequence is this, is basically huge infections, and it's a very costly uh, problem also. It's 20, more than $28 billion problem annually just in US. So we developed the first antimicrobial 3D printing portfolio, specially designed for 3D printing in the FDM technology, okay? Um, this is some of the laboratory res results from Chile. This is the rate of reduction, antimicrobial reduction of Staphylococcus aureus and Echerichia coli. Uh, and this is uh, what happened with 3D printing objects. The object is also antimicrobial. That is the important part. That is the interesting part. This is the, the same study, but now in US, in situ bioscience, it's a, a laboratory in US, 99.90. 99.99% of reduction in the 3D printed objects. That is a huge, uh, an interesting uh, concept. Uh, so this is what we actually sell, filaments for the 3D printing industry in the polymer sector right now. Uh, this is the antimicrobial performance. As you say, uh, as you see there, it's more than 99.99% of effectiveness. This is our first material. It's a PLA-based material, a PLA-based polymer. This is the second. Um, this is a PETG, PET antimicrobial material, and this is 
TPU, a flexible material. So basically the, the, the value proposal is with this portfolio of material you can 3D print antimicrobial objects like this, like this. This is a prototype, we are, we are not doing this. Our clients are doing crazy stuff, very interesting stuff. Antimicrobial uh, cell phone cases, antimicrobial insults. This is a, a, a develop uh, of, uh, of a company in, in UK. They are using, using this kind of insults for patients with diabetic foot. Super interesting. These kind of things, contact lens holder. I have one of these here. Okay, it's an antimicrobial contact lens holder. You, you can uh, forget about disinfectants, for example. Toys and all kinds of things. This is a, a develop of a, a company in, in UK. Uh, it's a, a Alexa cover for the units for, uh, for the units of child in isolation. In isolation unit, they have Alexa and they cover with this antimicrobial uh, structure to protect, and to protect the, the Alexa and to protect the children. So basically you can 3D print anything you want with this material. Uh, we have a strong um, network of resellers. Uh, we are right now selling in more than 40 countries around the world. And here in the room is Mr. Sailesh Kumar, which is our distributor of Orthoshed in India. So we have already the product here in India and this is like a, a very important thing for us. It's a, a, like a, a launch of the brand here in India. Uh, this is some of the, the projects that we are involved in right now. This project is uh, antimicrobial personalized toys for children in, isola in, in isolation units in a hospital in Chile. Uh, basically what we do is take draws of children and make a 3D model of the draw and 3D printing antimicrobial materials. I think it's the first time a company are doing these kind of things. Other um, project that we, we are developing is to tackle this problem, diarrheal disease. Basically, people drinking contaminated water. It's a huge problem. Uh, and what we think about is, uh, this is the concept, it's basically a structure, like a labyrinth structure where you can put contaminated water and the water uh, in, the, in the way of the, of the antimicrobial active material gets disinfected, disinfected. This is another concept. This is for a mother to child transmission of HIV, another huge problem. And the idea is to have an interface between mother and child. And in this structure, you can eliminate virus of HIV from milk. Uh, we are doing the testing in Chile and US and, going, uh, uh, and they are doing very well. That, that is the concept. And that is the team. It's a mix between uh, bi biomechanic uh, sector people, nanotechnologists, medical engineer, uh, and well, this is what we do. Antimicrobial three printing. In the in the afternoon, I am going to do a, a more longer talk. Uh, I think a 20 minute talk. Uh, I only have seven minutes right now. But uh, if you want to explore more about this concept, please come to my talk. Thank you. Great, superb. Thank you, Daniel. Appreciate uh, your information and appreciate the enlightening, inf enlightening information that you have provided to the audience today. Now I have the pleasure of calling on Dr. Mahesh Kapanavil. Kapanavil. And uh, he's going to talk about the challenges and impact of establishing India's first in-hospital medical 3D printing lab. He's going to elaborate and provide the information, this unique, authentic, superb information to you all today. Round of applause for Dr. Mahesh, please. A hearty round of applause. Dr. Mahesh. Thank you very much, uh, Shibu and the organizers, for getting me here to speak on this subject. Uh, I'm a pediatric cardiologist and uh, I've enjoyed coming into the field of 3D printing over the last few years. So this is the hospital where I work, Amrita Institute of Medical Sciences. This is in Cochin. This is a, a big uh, medical college and a state-of-the-art hospital. And let me start the story by uh, 
telling you a story about this young baby. I saw this baby when the baby was about six months old. If you look at the baby, you'll find something very unusual about the baby. Baby doesn't have this anterior, anterior bone called the breast bone or the sternum that acts as the protective covering over the heart and the lungs. So when the baby was born, the, pa the baby was given to the parents and they were shocked. What, what do we do with this baby? Because the doctors told them this is a very rare disease to which there is no treatment and nothing can be done. The baby is eventually going to die because the heart is going to get injured. So the, the parents were afraid to even hold the baby, bathe the baby uh, or make the baby sleep. Literally, they were not sleeping and they were just guarding over this baby but had no clue what to do with it. I saw this baby at, uh, uh, in, a, in a very rural place in uh, Kerala and, and they had kind of given up that, you know, they can do anything for this baby and doctors had told them very clearly that there's no real solution for this. So what we did was uh, something quite innovative and quite unique. So we brought the baby into the hospital and we did a CT scan. The CT, of course, allowed us to do a virtual dissection. So we were able to really go through the various tissue planes and understand what was really defective in this child. And we could very clearly see what was the part of the bone which was, which was defective. But then they, these are very, very rare cases, one in 10 lakhs, very few cases reported in the world, and no clear guidelines as to how we can help a child like this. So obviously the reason for fatality in these children is because of direct injury to the heart, because it is just beating right under the skin. So what we did was at the point of care 3D printing lab in Amrita, we, we did a virtual 3D reconstruction of the ch baby's entire chest wall, and we started a discussion with multiple specialists as to what do we think we can do. We went ahead and 3D printed the, the entire chest cage. And now the, uh, the, the doctor's team had a very realistic thing in their hands. Instead of just looking at two-dimensional images on a computer screen, now they had the patient's rib cage in their hands. So now that we had that, um, a multidisciplinary team got together, the cardiac surgeons, the plastic surgeons, the cardiologists, everybody, all of us sat together and started to think out of the box, what could we do? So then we came up with the idea, what if we can reconstruct this sternum? We thought of multiple ideas, including having a titanium implant, but then well, it will not grow with the child. You'll have to keep replacing. So finally, the plastic surgeons came up with the idea, why don't we take a piece of the rib on the right side and place it and, and, and make, recreate the sternum, which would ensure that it would grow with the baby. So we 3D printed out various parts of the rib so that the surgeons could really uh, look at that and understand. So they went through simulated surgical, uh, surgical pr uh, 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 kind of preparation over almost two weeks. And the whole procedure was really planned down to the minutest of details. And we took the patient up for surgery. And of course, the surgical findings were exactly as we had found on the 3D model, because it was a two scale, exactly one is to one scale model of the baby's chest. And they recreated the sternum using a part of the rib and this is the baby after the surgery and uh, this family uh, you cannot imagine the sense of gratification that this family had and they they celebrated the baby's first birthday with us in our hospital and they literally felt like their baby had been given a new life this is another boy who was brought to us by, he was 18 year old boy who was brought to us by a team from Discovery Channel. This is a young boy, 18 year old from Jharkhand who had this huge tumor of the face. It had started growing like a little pimple and then it had grown to such a huge size that at this point of time he was unable to eat, he was unable to breathe and he was just waiting to die. Every, everywhere the doctors had told him, oh, bhai, nothing can be done for this, this is too risky a surgery. Nobody would touch him with a barge pole. And uh, a team from Discovery Channel identified this kid and then they brought him over to Amrita to, uh, to our uh, plastic surgeon who's a very famous surgeon, Dr. Subramanya here. So you can see how, how, how grotesque it is. And even our surgeon had no clue how to deal with it. So he said, Mahesh, can we, can we 3D print out his soul anatomy? And then that's what we did. We reconstructed his anatomy and then we, we printed his skull with the tumor, without the tumor. We did the virtual surgery on the computer how it would look if you remove the tumor, what are the resection margins, and using all of that planning, we, we really planned it down, we, we, uh, we created a, a skull without the tumor, we mimicked the right side onto the left, mirrored it, and the entire surgery was planned, and finally this patient was operated, a, a 5 kg football sized tumor was uh, taken off his face, and his face was completely reconstructed using uh, 3D printed uh, surgical planning, and uh, the, this whole thing has been shown on episode 6, season 6 of this TV series called Body Bizarre. So this is again a story where 3D printing helped us. So all of this was made possible only because we had a point of care 3D printing lab where we, the moment we had the patient, 
we eventually could get into a discussion as to what could be done for, for these patients. And this is the 3D printing lab within Amrita, which was set up about four, five years back. And the story of our lab started with this young boy called Hari Krishnan, who came to me in 2014. I'm talking about five years from now, when 3D printing was even more primitive than what we had. This was a young boy with a very complex heart disease. And all through his childhood, he had been told that nothing can be done for him. He had been told that he was waiting to die. He was unable to go to school, but he was a brilliant boy. He used to sit at home and read about science and tech. And this was the first time that I used 3D printing to help him. I, I was the one who did his MRI. I was convinced we could operate him, but I could not convince my surgical team. That's when I 3D printed his heart uh, by collaborating with Materialize of Belgium. And when we presented this case again to our surgeons, in 10 minutes, a decision which had been declined for 18 years, that decision was taken in 10 minutes flat that we could operate him. The surgeons managed to exactly plan how they're going to operate him and fix him. And this kid was operated. And I want to show a small video about his story. It's about four minutes. So uh, after that, I'll conclude my sp uh, speech quite uh, fast. <laughs> Electronics, first degree student at the University of Kerala. My interest in electronics have started from just I was a kid itself. That made me what I am today. I was restricted to play outside because of my sickness. So mainly I use internet as a source to study myself. <laughs> My parents were so concerned about me. They supported me a lot. And also I could say they suffered a lot. My parents take me to different doctors and the doctors told directly in front of me there is no way to save me. Dr. Mahesh, I have heard a positive words that the surgery is possible. He's the person who put a sweet smile on my parents' face. The first time I actually contemplated using 3D printing to assist cardiac surgery was for a young boy called Hari Krishna. He had come to Amrita as a 17-year-old boy with a complex heart disease. When I presented his imaging information in our own surgical meeting, I was unable to convince my team that this surgery was really possible. When I represented Hari's case to our team with the 3D model, the entire perspective changed because now we had an actual replica of Hari's model in our hands. With the replicas in our hand, we can really understand the disease or the pathology much better and much before we ever go into surgery. By doing this, it prevents complications, it makes surgery much safer. Immediately after my surgery, I the uh, very first time I opened my eyes, I see Mahir sir. He asked me, how, how are you Hari? And I told that, sir, I'm fine. I just want to see my heart print. I showed him the model of his heart. And he looked at it and that's when he said, you know doctor, I have built my own 3D printer about three months back. That took me completely by surprise. When he was Working on building his 3D printer, he had no clue that somebody somewhere would use the same technology to actually heal him. That was the beginning of a, of a really strong bond between me and I. When I just got out of ICU, he called, called me and told that immediately after your rest, you have to make a printer for me. That was given me all the inspiration and I started making on the very next day of his words. 
Harleen was one of my major supports in thinking and dreaming about building a 3D printing unit at Amrita. I have been projected by several medical experts that are saying that there is no technology to solve your congenital heart problem. So I have to give back. I have to give back. He has the potential to really make a change to society. I think my bond with Hari is as close as it can get. He sees me as a mentor. I see him as my inspiration. We have a very strong bond which cannot be broken and this relationship will go on forever. Today, Hari is a very integral part of the 3D lab at Amrita. This is Hari with me in Barcelona two years back to attend the World Congress of Pediatric Cardiology and Cardiac Surgery. This is Hari with me at Mayo Clinic at the 3D printing, medical 3D printing facility in Mayo Clinic. This is Hari with me at the headquarters of Stratasys, the big 3D printer maker. So, and he is really an evangelist for 3D printing today. This is him speaking to a Kerala, stu a, a whole big group, 200 students of Kerala University speaking about 3D printing and impact of technology on human lives. So, Hari was instrumental in helping us set up this 3D printing lab. Even the physical space was designed by him. And there's so many other children who have then benefited from him. This is Izam, who had a very complex heart disease. Again, refused for 10 years, surgery was refused to him. A 3D print in hand made all the difference. Decisions could be taken. And case after case after case, now we have over 150 cases of cardiac and other specialty surgeries where complex anatomies, otherwise difficult to understand, become so simple for us to understand. Even a first year medical student, if he, he, he catches one of these models, he can understand what we are talking about. We can explain to the relatives. We can, it's a whole, it's a whole new game. And we make surgery and these procedures so much more safer, less blood loss, less complication, less stay in the, uh, in the ICUs and in the hospital. It really is, is, is a big, big game changer. So these are all examples of different kind of 3D models that we do on a, an everyday basis. We plan the surgical procedures, the way we close our VSDs or the holes in the heart. And every time we've also scientifically correlated that what we find on the 3D models is exactly as we found, find intraoperatively. So that whole validation is also very, very important. This is the case where we implanted a valve which was, which was completely made patient specific by using 3D printing. And not only cardiology, then because we had the lab within the hospital, different specialists across the hospital came together. They all asked, what can we do in our specialty with it? Orthopedicians, neurosurgeons, vascular surgeons, because it became so accessible. It was easy for them to just walk into our room and say, Ki, okay, let, let's just discuss about this complex case we have. And so that's, that's the biggest advantage of having an in-house lab. So this is a 13-year-old with a spinal deformity from Lanka, a road traffic accident with a pelvic fracture. So the list just keeps on going. So obviously it has so many benefits to have, to, to have 3D printing access to yourself. And then having a, a point-of-care printing lab, it really makes life so much more easier, so much more accessible, affordable. The turnaround times really come down. A patient comes into my OPD today, in the next two hours I may have the CT scan and by the evening I'll have a 3D print ready. I don't have to depend on, on anybody. And much of this work is done by us as clinicians. So it, 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 is, it is truly a very big game changer. And we've, been, uh, we've received significant recognition for this, including a President House invitation and ICMR award for innovation. We've also gone on to publish our work. It's important to publish work in scientific journals to provide scientific validation for this entire process of medical 3D printing. Of course, we still need to keep up with the, with the changing technology, both in hardware and software. That's going to be the challenge. And I think that we all need to work together from across sectors, across disciplines, people from technology, people from medicine, people from software. Everybody needs to keep continuing to work together. Material scientists, so important. So we all need to work together. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, thank you, uh, Dr. Mahesh. Uh, really appreciate the same. In fact, this, uh, what we have witnessed now here, is completely miraculous. And uh, when things we experience, and the word is experience, miraculous things in our lives, we realize that there's more to our lives than what our five senses absorb. 
So with that, I'm going to call on Sai Santosh Manipal, Manipali, the simulation adoption for medical advance through additive manufacturing. Please help me in welcoming Mr. Sai Santosh. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, good morning. It's been a pleasant morning to be at this event. Uh, yeah, I have been hearing a lot of uh, tech talk that's uh, directed towards 3D printing and its advantages. So today, I would be coming up on with uh, a broad level talk on two topics which have a very good possibility of fusion. One would be additive manufacturing and the Difficulties up with uh, my slides, of course. I'd be talking and introducing where I come from. Um, and the two topics I would broadly be speaking upon are respectively additive manufacturing and simulation. And the synergy between using physics based simulation to predict the trends within 3D printing uh, before we really get into a physical prototype testing, uh, how could someone benefit from simulation-based solutions on 3D printing? So that's my topic for the day. And uh, coming to introduce myself, I come from CATFEM Engineering Services Private Limited, which is a brand that is known for its specialization in simulation engineering and medical domains as well. Uh, we also have expertise in this 3D printing uh, predominantly. Uh, so we are a 35-year-old uh, company dating back to 1985, our roots across uh, Central Europe, indeed. So we are headquartered in Central Europe with this kind of simulation expertise. So we are the uh, largest and oldest channel partners of ANS Sync, which develops uh, uh, state-of-the-art simulation-based uh, software um, into several multi-physics domains, of course. So we spread across uh, 22 nations worldwide. So we are working over Central Europe and in India with a consortium of medical experts, indeed. Um, therefore, we tend to understand the collaboration between the medical domain and also the engineering physics, basically. Uh, so uh, just waiting for some of these slides to come up, of course where I would be talking about uh, the 3D printing process and how simulation would be helping that particular processing indeed. So this forum has been very beneficial, of course, to share a lot of ideas and to proceed forth, of course. Um, when I actually talk about uh, simulation engineering and the way it could indeed impact the quality of 3D printing, it's more to tell you about uh, how certain components are over-designed or over-engineered with the heft of a lot of material being put into uh, places where it is actually not necessary. So our twofold aim, actually, when we get into 3D printing realm, is to see that uh, the stiffness of a particular component or the strength of a particular component is very well maximized, at the same time having the weight reduction into the place, or the mass reduction into the place. So this calls for very good uh, saving of material costs, of course. And at the same time, stiffness is imparted to that part. Uh, they, especially coming to domains such as orthopedics and then specifically to dentistry as well, 
there are several success stories and case studies where additive manufacturing has outshined the traditional manufacturing processes such as the subtractive or the formative processes. Well, I'm definitely comparing it to its counterparts which are subtractive and these formative technologies. So there are certain uh, patient specific customizations which are possible to be introduced and implemented only when you take the help of 3D printing. I mean, when you go by the conventional manufacturing procedures, there could be a shortcoming in the way of realizing them. And well, as I said, again, we are always guided by the twofold objective. Make things very patient specific and address safety and comfort of the patients. Let it be dentistry, let it be the orthopedic domain, whatever it could be. And technically coming back, we remember to have our twofold objective always railed upon. One is good strength, good stiffness with less mass, less weight. Well, for that, you have to, of course, uh, test it through simulations, know the kind of uh, stressed up re uh, regions in the kind of geometry, find out the regions where you have uh, most of the stresses, and find out that way ways. By looking at the diagnosis or the contour of a simulation, it is definitely possible to see those areas where topology optimization can be playing a better role in reducing the mass and still retaining the required stiffness or the strength of a particular object. Well, uh, that's what we go upon when it is a dentistry, say a jaw joint that you have to put up, or uh, maybe in the case where you have to kind of put up a pelvis type of uh, joint as well, the additive manufacturing is coming in with a lot of advantages. So coming back to that dentistry thing, there was a particular case in Europe where indeed um, it's been that with conventional manufacturing or bone grafting, when there was a huge bone loss in a particular case, it was not possible to follow conventional procedures like bone grafting and so on, because that could have then led to multiple surgeries and the rehabilitation time taken by the patient in that case could have been more otherwise. But taking the aid thanks to 3D printing, thanks to this additive manufacturing, the titanium-based alloy was used to print a very intelligent type of uh, uh, tooth joint in that case using the 3D printing actually very beneficially to the patient and the number of surgeries that are required when, it, when I compare it to the conventional procedure that has been very greatly reduced in that particular case using uh, 3D printing its advantages. So whenever we try to engineer an innovative component like this, looking beyond the limitations of traditional manufacturing, what we intend to also see is to optimize it with less virtual prototyping. And in a medical field like this, we can't really go upon such innovations just based on virtual prototyping, because then that calls for heavy investment in clinical studies as well. So that clinical studies could be impairing to the uh, volunteers who enroll for them as well. And there is a cost component associated with that as well. So yeah, that, that's where 3D printing and simulations come into a grand synergy to facilitate this kind of patient specific uh, customization. So it's all about more of patient specific customization to be used. So we actually get into a lot of details. So there is a lot of material data requirement as well definitely that is required when you are dealing with uh, the case of additive manufacturing. Yeah, we do have databases which can provide for powder level material data as well. So when it is coming particularly upon titanium and cobalt chromium, any grade of these alloys, we do really have the material data. And definitely, uh, as this has been a repeated question, continuous question upon material data that we have been receiving through our current interactions with the customers as well, we are, we are definitely open to networking and uh, uh, offline talk about this topic in a different way. So we try to find out a match on providing a particular set of material data and we can definitely work upon. And just taking one step ahead while implementing 3D printing, there is a definitive focus on following the scan patterns into simulations that are coming from the machine and the way the laser is actually 
focusing its energy. That's also very important. So it's possible to consider definitely all these physically present influences again to be accommodated into our simulations. So well, we are really open for offline talking about this particular subject. And thanks for the opportunity. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. So I want to thank you, Mr. Sai Santosh. Great. And uh, sometimes it's important to uh, connect with our faculties of imagination and create, utilize our mind, mental faculties, to create certain things and imagine certain things. Now I'm going to call upon uh, GL Sudhakar to talk about AM and uh, healthcare integration. I uh, please help me welcoming G. L. Sudhakar. Hi. On the healthcare side. To be on the, the just a few words on the advantages. I think uh, Mr. Anand would have done in the morning. Uh, here you have the weight loss. So basically, when you you can have something called as a lattice structures which is very, very advantageous for the medical and the aerospace uh, industry. So the weight reduction, say for example, in aerospace it is uh, very, very uh, helpful because you, if you are reducing one kg of weight on an aircraft, then it has a ripple effect of the cost as well as the CO2 emission on our environment. So here the lattice structure which is very, very helpful for that area and on the medical front the lattice structure again is very helpful because uh, actually in some of the presentation I saw the, the implant was very heavy. So here they can use an implant with the lattice structures. I have some few models, maybe in the, during the break we can have a look. I know everyone are a bit hungry, even I am also hungry. So I will finish up within the stimulated time of 7 minutes. Uh, these are the some of the uh, customizing, customize, these are advantages, basically I am not going to go too much on this area. Okay, just to give you an overview, what is the life cycle, because we were talking about 3D printing in the medical industry, what, what is it going to happen. Like uh, right from the patient, you have the image like the 3D scan or the CT scan. So from that the, the bone data and the tissue data are separated and then you do the design wherein we were talking right from the morning, few of the doctors had spoken on that area, then you build the implant. This comes, the EOS is very good at that and then you do a post processing. That means if you have a stabilar cup where it needs the inner side, the, the inner side has to be machined. You need to do a post operation on that. It's not just like from your machine. The 3D print, you get it and then you directly, you can't use it. You need to do some kind of a post-processing operations on that, then you can use it. So the final one is the inspection, cleaning and the sterilization. This here also you get the sterilization part is done, the inspection part and the certification part, which is very, very important in the medical industry because the material, the process and the implant has to be certified. So in US, it's again, you have the FDA certifications, very, very important and without that you can never implant any implants in US. But in India, it's still on the nascent phase, I think. So hopefully we come up with these certifications at the earlier stage so that it will be easier for the patients, benefits for the patients so that we will not have any issues like what they had in Johnson & Johnson. They had to pay a lot of millions of dollars back. Just a small statistics, by 2022, it's, uh, the, the market, the medical market is about 26 billion. And uh, in US, out of 20 hospitals, 16 hospitals are using the 3D printing by any way. It's not only the implant, it can be as uh, models, uh, surgical models, like uh, what were the earlier presentations that had been given. And also, okay, this is a bit old, so we'll just uh, skip that. Okay, what are the materials, which is very important. This has a very, because when you are getting into an implant, into the body, 
it has a lot of certification, a lot of tests and things has to be done on that. So US has a medical material for titanium which is uh, approved by FDA. So that means you have in the triangle process material and the machine, the material is already certified by FDA and the machine which is that has also been certified by FDA. So you have only one process that is the process part has to be certified that is being once an implant is done then that implant has to be certified. So you are done almost two third of your job is done by US and one third only you have to complete like the, the certification for the implant the PSI implants. Currently we don't have so the material the most the material is the titanium material that is the mostly widely used we also use for cobalt chrome and the pure titanium but it's not very good but cobalt chrome normally we use on the dental side uh, and if you're taking the overall picture of uh, 3d printing 72 percent 79 percent goes on the medical on the metal side because it has a wide variety of applications or the implants uh, on the uh, because the material is implantable but on the polymer side the plastic side it cannot be implanted it's a biocompatible and not biodegradable so that's why you have the lesser version like uh, where you can see on the bottom you have the medical guides surgical guides rather for example if you want to have a cranial implant or the TKRs you need to have the guides okay out of 70% uh, of whatever we had sold the machines 70% is on metal which is on the medical market this is the worldwide one okay what are we going we are going in for the next is uh, the serial production that means we are talking about parts we are talking about one off cases for example the PSIs are just one off cases are customizable but if you want to have which in uh, the, the PSI the, the customized implants are cost goes very high because you are doing it for one single component so the manufacturing cost is high so what we do is if you are have an acetabular cup we have about 10 or 15 types of different customized acetabular cups which can be built in one single shot which where you can get the cost reduction there you can bring the cost very much down and also in this this is the one what I was talking about the lattice structure this is one of the lattice structure where you can increase or decrease the porosity and also the strut size so this gives you a very good osteo integration so that the TKRs the implants fix very good and the healing process is much faster okay this is the how the implant cost can be brought down by building multiple number of paths so here if you see we in a, in a, this is a smaller machine what we have the, the medium one in that you get about 16 cups like this arranged and it takes about 12 hours and if you take the difference the porosity if you change the porosity it takes about 13 hours and each cost would be around 53 euros 52 to 53 euros of one acetabular cup okay suppose if you are going for the higher machine the bigger volume machine it takes about 36 cups at one single shot and takes about 8 hours per job so which is around 45 euros so the number of parts increase in a build you can bring down the cost drastically and this is not only for the stabilar cups you can have spine spaces different spine spaces can be built in one single build so the cost can be brought down and also uh, this is for a, a cancer patient this was a design uh, done actually because uh, uh, this is at the design stage and that is post operative stage and uh, I'll just rush through because uh, these are all uh, this is again a uh, temporo uh, mandibular uh, joint 
and on the polymer side this is basically for the polio attack people where they have to carry the entire the huge uh, leg which they have to carry but instead of that they were redesigned in such a way that they can have this particular artificial leg so that they don't need to carry that heavy uh, leg what what the whatever is the uh, i don't know sorry i'm i'm not a medical guy uh, sorry with that so i can't use the medical terms basically i'm a mechanical engineer but just working on this medical side for the past 5 years uh, so this is a design which has been made for them and it was very effective and we uh, in europe we at most we do a lot of of these kind of designs depending on the uh, area or how how the polio attack and how the patients are again it is the spine space uh, sorry the the uh, guides but it's not only the guides but along with the guides you have so many other things which comes out so those things can also be 3d printed so this again for the standard tkr so there are so many standard tkrs for that you need all these guides again so this if the tkrs if you are taking you can take the other plastic components and manufacture them in one single build the cost of this comes down very drastically because we can stack and print okay it is not that only one layer you can stack one over the other and print okay you can have a full build so that the cost comes down okay and the another thing is this uh, instruments special instruments for the operations so this can also be designed and it can also be manufactured and again it is again in the titanium okay this is all about somewhere outside but let us see what we have done in india i'll just run through because uh, it's it's self explanatory uh, so they want to do a reconstruction here the maxilla facial so they had a uh, two designs so like this is the design what they had done and then it was implanted it was after 15 days of the so again this is a cancer patient so again this is again a maxilla uh, facial uh, this is uh, revision surgery someone was mentioning in the morning uh, they want to do a revision surgery and here there was a revision there was having an issue and they had a revision of the stabilizer cup and it was redesigned in such a way that so that uh, they were able to uh, sort out the issue this is the post op again uh, this is uh, the space this is again a, a correction facial corrections uh, then again this is again a mandible but there was a to the lower jaw was totally uh, gone because of the cancer so they had to reconstruct the entire um, uh, lower jaw this is after a month and all this is done in india okay so i think it's all indian market uh, again uh, this is again a lower jaw and there is also a alignment mandible so that uh, it's, a, it's a two and uh, this is again a lower jaw they had a, i think they had a, a big tumor which they removed and uh, they had a implant and this is the post operative a few words so that's the indian side what we had done there are many things that many implants that we had done but still some some i cannot show to you we are on the cranial side we were not able to show many things because it is again they they asked us not to show them uh, okay this is a, a few about we are into about 30 years for the medical we are coming up another for about last 7 8 years we are into the medical field we are coming up so hopefully we we I wanted to grow along with 3d para so that uh, we also contribute we can also contribute a lot on the 3d printing side to the medical industry okay this is the partners whom for the post processing and the pre processing like you have the uh, data preparations and also the post processing application so these are the ecosystem and uh, 60 to 70% of them are been funded by uos itself for 
be it a software, be it a post-processing activity, uh, it's also been funded by EOS. Because we spend around 24% of our revenue back to the R&D and to the ecosystem. Okay, to just a summary, about 62 medical device companies uses, this is again a US based. So before I close, I just wanted to show you a small video. This is on the polymer side. Now this is what four years back, but now they have also had the sensors for the knees and the hip. So we have we are the first ones to come up with uh, 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 sensors which can uh, guide itself. Like in artificial intelligence has been placed in that. So if you have a uh, an instruction given, it automatically does. So on seeing, so it automatically behaves whatever like a normal human activity. So that's the latest stage, but uh, uh, we are yet to come up with that uh, as a video. So maybe in the next uh, in, uh, interaction, maybe I can show you that video. So with that, I conclude. Thank you. Any questions, I can take off. Thank you, appreciate the same, uh, Mr. Sudhakar. Great, superb, fantastic. Now, you know, Mr. Sai Santosh gave us a lot of enlightening information. However, due to a small technical glitch, we were unable to experience the phenomenal presentation. So what we are gonna do is, for a short period or span of time, we are going to be experiencing the presentation right now. So I'm going to call on Mr. Sai Santosh and please help me welcome Mr. Sai Santosh with a hearty round of applause. Yeah. Hello all. Hello again. So I'm going to go through my presentation. Sorry for this technical glitch. Yeah. So yeah, that's the global print of the company I come from, CADFEM Worldwide present in 22 nations across the globe and been a veteran in simulation engineering we are leading a consortium of uh, <coughs> medical engineering as well with a sister company of our association called CADF Medical GmbH, which has doctors, uh, medical professionals, and also engineers. A lot of interdisciplinary interaction in that case coming along together. Yeah. So we've been in this b technology business uh, since the last 35 years, as I already briefed upon. Yeah. So we have to definitely agree upon the point that. Uh, this additive manufacturing technology is uh, something much beyond the scope of traditional manufacturing technologies such as it could be subtractive, formative, etc. It's taking uh, the technology to the next leap and pushing limits much ahead, definitely being the additive one indeed. So uh, when I say that there are definitely many engineering components which are over designed and we are overcoming that and also certain shapes of the components which are realized from a topology optimization sense may not be manufacturable using only the traditional techniques of manufacturing. That's where additive is coming into all the aid for us. So it's definitely disruptive and it's able to create certain meta materials which are a combination or super combination of conventional engineering materials and they have been bearing super specialty uh, applications or they have really combinational synergistic properties coming along from the individual materials. It's possible to realize their manufacturing as well in an intact sense using the 3D printing technique. And most of my presentation definitely is featuring upon metal-based additive manufacturing technology. 
yeah so what you see on this slide uh, basically is a component which you see is over designed that's the initial way it's been designed actually uh, so that's the over designed component which you see with a lot of material in different places and you see how topologically has it been optimized and once there is a topology optimization of that particular component it is also uh, a mandate that we again test it if that topologically optimized component where you remove the material right you have removed the material the objective has been twofold again connect to the twofold objective please it's about uh, having stiffness intact maintained at the same time reducing the mass over there so it needs a revalidation with the uh, simulations of course like you have seen there and then coming to the metallic 3d printing metal as a material can have thermal wear page when the laser is acting upon it so you have to encounter that and counteract upon it basically using special supports and it's possible to conceive the kind of supports that are needed by using the technique of 3d manufacturing and well in terms of that 3d manufacturing physics based supports can be realized by using simulations so that's what you see over there physics based supports for this particular component and then it's also possible to study the development of the microstructure of that particular component the lattice optimization and things like that at the microscopic level as well it's possible to realize and study them very well using simulations uh, well when the material is getting deposited layer by layer you do have certain things to move on with the microstructure thing and it's also possible to look at that by using these simulations successfully and well on this slide you have a capitulation of different parameters that are usually regarded as important parameters while you go for this 3d printing it could be laser power melt velocity and the others that are just specified here the wish list is to have an optimal combination for a particular goal driven sense when you are working with different applications for that and it's possible to realize that using parametric simulations so it's all about virtually realizing a lot of things before you hit a track with reality which will save money and which will save a lot of costs of course yeah uh, details definitely matter every machine that is going to operate upon this 3d printing technology will have a definitive scan pattern and that scan pattern creates a unique type of multiple dynamics in the molten form of this powder so it's possible to regard and have all those thermal gradients very well captured which are driven by this unique scan patterns in simulations coming from different types of machines there yeah uh, actually when you look at additive manufacturing it's not something that is dependent and governed or driven by a single physics alone it's a combination of different physics it could be structural simulations to look at the uh, stresses over there the uh, residual stresses are important that can be looked at thermal gradients for residual stresses they can be the cause of it and you can look at them in structural simulations for cft simulations of course you look at the multiple dynamics and some components like the centrifugal pumps can be optimized before getting into production in a fluid dynamic sense less pressure drop minimized losses etc and well there are latest technologies coming up where 3d printers are involving or including uh, electromagnetic pump as well in that cases it could become important to capture the trends of electromagnetic field which are inserted there and also the laser dynamics so all this can be seen in one simulation it's a multi physics coupling simulation that facilitates to see things like that yes uh, yeah coming back and relating all this on how we can benefit uh, uh, from all these technologies in a medical perspective I do have two case studies here actually one is about a dental dentistry implant like I was explaining before it was hard to manufacture this type of implant for the dentistry using traditional manufacturing methodologies it was possible only through additive manufacturing there were other methods in this case involved like bone grafting etc with conventional manufacturing or conventional surgery practices but in that case it was to go for multiple surgeries a series of multiple surgeries rehabilitation time also was a challenge over there so those challenges were very well overcome by using 3d printing and that 3d printing has been enabled to this status in this case with the aid of simulations running behind as a capable enabling engine 
And then the other case study is about the pelvis. It was a bone cancer case study where a lot of bone has been eaten away by uh, at the pelvis site by the cancer cells. Then it was possible to operate it in an efficient way providing a patient specific physiologically enabled implant by 3D printing things there. Again, simulation played a major role in coining that kind of implant coming up with that. So again, as I was iterating and now reiterating again about the material data importance. So when it is a powder form that you are dealing with, th the same titanium grade alloy would have different properties in its bulk sense and also in the powder sense. It's possible to realize and kind of take all these properties from the kind of specialized database we can provide. Uh, and I think this would be a hot topic for offline discussion, so I welcome uh, these kind of discussions definitely willingly. Yeah. So yeah, with that I kind of conclude my presentation, um, pointing you to the fact that additive manufacturing can be enabled and it can be driven to realize its full potential when simulation kicks in and provides much support to it in the background and you can predict things like distortion, the kind of physics based supports that are needed in additive manufacturing, the failures can be predicted beforehand microstructures can be analyzed and there is much more scope in the synergy of simulation and additive manufacturing. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Mike, please. So thank you, Mr. Sai Santosh. Really appreciate the enlightening, superb information.